Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm Ron Altrovitz, and I'm an NIH postdoctoral fellow at um, UC Berkeley and also in the Department of Radiation Oncology at UCSF. And the work that I've been focused on is on medical needle insertion procedures. And needle insertion is used in a wide variety of applications in medicine, from biopsies to anesthesia drug injections to cancer treatments like brachytherapy. And in all of these procedures, it is often necessary to guide the needle to a very specific point in soft tissue. And this can be difficult for a number of factors, and oftentimes the success of the procedure depends on how accurate the needle can be guided to that specific target. And so the work that I'll, I've been working on that I'll talk about here uh, looks at developing computational algorithms as well as integrating that with new uh, needle hardware to enable physicians to more accurately guide needles to targets um, and also to enable uh, the guidance of needles to targets that previously were inaccessible. So our collaborations have so far have been primarily with physicians in radiation oncology, but of course we're looking at many different other applications as well. And the specific procedure that we've looked at is prostate brachytherapy, where physicians use needles to implant uh, radioactive sources uh, inside cancerous tissues like inside uh, the prostate. And uh, the, the seeds must be very precisely placed so that there's a high radiation dose at the location of the tumor and low elsewhere. And one of the initial challenges that physicians often say they encounter is that of tissue deformations. When they insert the needle, which is um, shown here in, the, in yellow, uh, into the prostate, which is shown in this ultrasound image outlined in green, uh, to a target shown by the red cross, uh, tissue deformations often occur, which you can see here in this simulation. And so even though the needle is, can be inserted to the target, uh, there's this large placement error that often develops. So what we've been looking at is developing a biomechanical uh, simulation uh, that tries to predict these tissue deformations. And we can then use that, the, that simulation um, as a function and optimization routine to try to minimize the effect of these placement errors. And so I can show that here. On the right, we see that if we insert the needle somewhat higher than the target and somewhat deeper, uh, then we can reduce that placement error. And so we've been looking at uh, improvements on these simulation methods to try to capture the essence of the deformations. Since uh, deformable tissues is something very difficult to model, but if we can capture the essence of that, uh, we can still develop computational tools to reduce these errors. And so that was one issue of, uh, of deformations. Another problem that physicians often said that they encountered was that of maneuverability. There were some targets that they would like to guide the needle to, but because traditional needles are fairly stiff, um, it wasn't possible to find a straight line path from outside the patient to the target without colliding with obstacles such as bones or sensitive tissues such as arteries or nerves um, or tissues that shouldn't be punctured by the needle. And so for cases like that, uh, we've been working with a group in, uh, in Johns Hopkins University of Alison Okamura, and we've been developing a new type of needle, a steerable medical needle, that has two key properties. The first is that it's flexible. And the second is that it has a bevel tip rather than uh, something like a pencil tip. And the bevel tip means that as it's being inserted into soft tissue, it exerts asymmetric forces on the surrounding soft tissue. And because it's flexible, it will then bend in the direction of the bevel. And so we can see in the image on the right that when this needle was inserted into an artificial tissue phantom, it followed this, this curved path. And so this raises um, interesting new possibilities uh, I can highlight the, the, the path there in blue. If we instead decide to insert the needle and then at some point decide to rotate the base by 180 degrees, uh, because the needles are torsionally stiff, even though they're flexible, this will change the direction that the bevel points, and then we can follow uh, a path that follows a, uh, a curve radius of curvature in the opposite direction. But planning for these paths is difficult. So one of the main reasons is that these bevel tip needles are highly sensitive to inhomogeneities in the tissue at the needle tip, which can cause the forces at the needle tip to vary somewhat. And so even though we would ideally like it to follow these ideal constant curvature paths, in many cases there will be um, inhomogeneous tissue that will cause something like a deflection, and then the needle will follow a path that's somewhat different from the expected path. And so we'd like to look at computational algorithms that will consider this type of deflection at the planning stage. And so what we've done is we've looked at, uh, in this particular example, we have the prostate outlined in orange, and we can start the needle at uh, the green bar on the left, and we want to end up at the target uh, indicated by the green circle. And so a traditional path uh, approach would be to find just the shortest path that's subject to the constraints of the, the needle's curvature 
and that uh, connects the start region to the target. But taking this approach can often lead to failures because this will mean that the needle is guided between narrow, uh, narrow gaps between obstacles. And because the needle's motion is uncertain, this can cause um, deflections, which would then cause collisions uh, with these obstacles. So as an alternative approach, we've been looking at other more general planning methods that explicitly try to maximize the probability that the procedure will actually succeed, that we will reach the target successfully. And so our approach here has been that we first uh, do some pre-computation where we construct a roadmap type data structure, uh, which is in essence trying to, to speed up this method by doing pre-computation. We can then use imaging techniques to um, sense the current state. And then we can execute a query, which would ask, uh, what should we do at our particular state? We can then execute that optimal action. And these actions would be something that are, that are very simple and local. For example, insert the needle half a centimeter bevel right, for example. Um, there would be the expected path that the needle would follow given that, 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 that action, but uh, because motion is uncertain, we'll end up at some new point and then we can continue the loop. So using an approach like this, we can compute plans that are somewhat different than may have somewhat longer paths, but the key advantage of these paths is that they avoid the obstacles in such a way that even when there is uncertainty in the needle's motion, uh, the probability that we would successfully reach the target without colliding with an obstacle is greater. And this is a sort of computation that we can do a lot of, of pre-computation and then give the physician um, information that will be much harder to uh, intuitively figure out. So we're also looking now at um, other applications of, or other uh, computational approaches to find paths for these steerable needles. And one issue is, again, the issue of tissue deformations. Uh, we can design steerable needles since we're designing them from the ground up. Uh, we can design them with materials that would uh, have particular smoothness properties that would minimize the effect of deformations, uh, but it is still somewhat unavoidable. And so we've also looked at um, planning methods, which you can see on the left, where um, this is a simulation, but we could, in theory, uh, mount these types of needles on an endorectal probe and insert into the prostate, which is outlined in yellow. Uh, and maneuver around obstacles to reach a target that otherwise would not be accessible by a straight line path. And this is, again, a simulation with constrived obstacles, not the real example, since these needles are still in the development stage. And then on the right, we're also now looking at full 3D extensions. And this is a joint work with Vincent Dwindham and Shankar Sastri at Berkeley, where we're looking at uh, the full 3D motion of these needles. And what's interesting here is that you can model these needles as following helical paths, where you could take, for example, a screw and put a little dot on that screw. And as you, 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 you screw the screw in, you'll see that uh, that point will then follow a helical, a helical path. And there's a lot of geometric theory and computational theory behind that we can, that we can now bring in uh, to solving uh, motion plans for these types of steerable needles that are capable in full 3D of following these helical paths. And so what I've talked about so far is um, the development of these steerable needles, the hardware behind it, and also the motion planning algorithms, um, as well as some of the initial applications that we've looked at in radiation oncology. But we're also very interested in, in hearing and learning about other applications in medicine where these types of steerable needles could be applicable and, um, and new applications as well as uh, new possibilities. And so thank you and uh, be happy to take any questions or suggestions for future work. Yes? What would be the advantage of, of this versus a kind of needle that you could actively like, bend at the tip and, and guide it that way? That's a very good question. Um, Sorry. There are uh, several groups worldwide that are working on using um, actively steered needles that use uh, something like a snake-like robot technique. Uh, you can view it almost like a snake and there are actuators inside and then you have a large number of degrees of freedom and you can very actively control it. Um, one of the, the complications of doing that is that these are very complicated electronic or mechatronic devices. And when inserting this into a patient, uh, this then brings a whole level of new risks. Uh, one little electrical or mechanical failure could cause very catastrophic results for the patient. And so as a result of that, it's very hard to develop uh, these types of actively steerable devices that are both compact enough and safe enough. Uh, one of the advantages of the approach that we've, uh, we've been working on here is that it's in essence completely passive. The, the needle is controlled solely outside the base. And so you decide its direction by rotating the needle base, and that will change the direction of the needle tip, meaning that there's no active electronics uh, inside the patient. It's all external. And so that means that it's both lower cost and that there's much safer, and uh, it simplifies the design substantially. The trade-off there, though, is that it, be, it makes these, um, these uncertainty issues much more complicated, which is why we have to address them algorithmically and computationally uh, to make this uh, a viable and worthwhile uh, type of needle steering approach. Um, so 
I was a little puzzled why you, why the paths are just helical because obviously you're changing the rotation rate as you insert the needle and also um, the medium itself is going to tend to distort the shape of the needle. Uh, the, mo the more wiggly your path, the more distortion the medium is going to impose on the needle itself. Uh, so it seems like you're going to get quite complicated shapes, not just helices. Absolutely. That's, um, I use the example of helical in the sense that that's the, the simplest shape you would get out in the sense that if you insert it with a constant rotation, that's what you would end up with. But you can vary the rate of your, insert, the rate of your rotation uh, and hence produce much more complicated insertion patterns. And in particular, if you don't rotate at all, then you would follow an arc pretty much just like you would in the two-dimensional case. And so part of the motion planning aspect of that is considering all these different possibilities uh, in the motion planning stage. Uh, the helical being the one that you don't get in 2D um, that you introduce in 3D. Yes, so in the, in the first ver um, simulation that I showed at the very beginning, uh, we looked at just the traditional needle insertion and we looked at the simulation aspect. And so for that, what initially would be required in all cases is an initial image of the patient where you can outline the anatomy um, and get some information. And from there, uh, you can use a computational simulation that, that uses patient-specific parameters like, like tissue stiffnesses and so forth um, to build a deformable model of the tissues. Um, and then you can model uh, the deformations that would occur during insertion. Um, that will incur some error, but it can be do, uh, we've shown based on our past work that we can develop a simulation that will do better than ignoring deformations. And so as a result, these are still worthwhile simulations to create. Uh, that's, that's one aspect. And if you have the, a simulation that's sufficiently accurate, then you can uh, not rely on the real-time imaging um, and assume that you have your deformable model, which is, which is sufficiently good, and just use that. Um, an alternative approach is to do something more image-guided where you always have this sensor in the loop. Um, and that's the, one of the initial approaches we took with the needle steering on, on um, a couple slides back. And there, um, the idea is that every time you, you, you get the image, you see where you are, um, and then you, you use some pre-computed data structure where that essentially allows you to very quickly replan based on the deformations that you just observed. We have a question. The assumption here is that there's a human at the other end inserting the needle, and if that's the assumption, a robotic could do the same thing. That's We have well, actually looked just at... as precise or better than a human hand. Yes, we've actually looked at both. And in terms of um, shorter time to getting these types of needles in active use, um, having a physician in the loop is, 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 is kind of a shorter term goal. Uh, but a longer term goal is absolutely the robotic devices. And we've been collaborating with a group at Johns Hopkins, Alex and Okamura, and together they've also worked with others at Johns Hopkins, like Abor Fichtinger, who have actually developed needle insertion robots uh, that in the long run we would like to integrate with these sorts of algorithms and have it... Um, basically robot and algorithms, and then a physician observing to make sure that everything is going according to plan. Yes? Okay, it's a very nice concept, but my question is, when you try to rotate this, uh, you know, if you rotate this in the free space, there should be no problem. But what happens if you have already get a couple of terms inside of the tissues, with the rotation or the torsion force will prevent you to accurately, you know, redirect your tip directions uh, according to the bevel direction. Yes, that's absolutely correct. And, and when we do the, the motion planning, we want to, um, in the long run, be able to take that into account, where there is, as the more you insert, your, your steerability will essentially uh, decrease as a function of, your, of the amount that you've inserted already. And so that's something that we'd like to take into account at the planning stage. Um, but there's still a sufficient steerability that you can reach certain targets that previously would have been inaccessible. Oh. So, I guess you need to add some sort of, sort of you know, orientation thing to tell you which your direction, right? Because you probably don't know eventually what, I mean, you can do the simulation, but you don't know your target direction would be due to the, you know, t complexity of the tissue. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So. That can, uh, however, be modeled, and you can insert torque force sensors also at the needle base. And so while that's a very important problem, there are uh, methods both in terms of hardware and software that we can use to start to address that. But that's definitely an issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you. 
I had one question. What type of image guidance are you thinking about using? Uh, I saw ultrasound, and that looks like MR there. I'm yes. just wondering from, from the MR point of view, and I guess it's a segue to the next talk, <laughs> is how are you going to make these, these needles MR safe? So that's another very good question. So we've, um, we've looked primarily initially at ultrasound, but also um, there is a group at Brigham Women's Hospital um, in Massachusetts that has looked at making uh, robots safe, uh, ro uh, basically robots that are safe to use in MR machines. Uh, where there's an opening on the MR machine for the robot to go in, so sort of an open MRI, um, and the robot's made out of equipment that would allow that to happen. And so at that point, uh, using similar materials that were used in the robot, we envision uh, being able to construct the needles as well. And so that is a materials question, which um, these are still under development, but that's something that in the long run we think would be possible. We have one more question. Just to follow up that one, what material is the needle made of now? The initial uh, prototypes were made out of nitinol, uh, but that's still a material that's it's definitely an up in the air question. So if anybody has suggestions on that, we'd be very happy to hear suggestions on new materials to try. That, that's pretty MR compatible. Okay. Thank you.